We live in a fantasy world now. Reality has been destroyed. This is the time that we really need to pay attention. The probabilities are overwhelmingly on gold's side. That is the best environment to see gold increase its value. Welcome to Palisades Gold Radio. I'm your host, Tom Bodrovix. Joining me today is Corey Flack, host of the KE Report. Thanks for joining me today, Corey. Hey, thanks for the invite, Tom. So with most of the equity markets near all-time highs right now, are you sensing more fear or optimism from general investors? And do they really have one foot out the door ready for an exit at any time? Honestly, I, I haven't seen a whole lot of positioning from the generalists to be quick to exit right now. I, I talked to a lot of generalists and I understand they are putting some hedges on some of their long positions, but there is still this buy the dip mentality and even this recent, let's call it flatlining by the U.S. equity markets over the last about month and a half to two, there's not a whole lot of fear that's coming into the generalist standpoint. Now, of course, when you talk to a lot of kind of the precious metals folk, then there's always that fear in the markets. And rightfully so, we're seeing massive valuations. You can go to a lot of these valuation metrics and they're off the charts. However, they have been that way for a while. And Quite frankly, as we continue to see money rotate within different sectors of the market, it keeps these markets elevated. So I understand why some people are saying, look, a, a crash is coming or a correction is coming. I'm more in the camp that a correction is coming because this has been a, a lengthy bull run here. But I'm not in the camp that there's a crash coming and I'm not hearing a whole lot from the guests on my show that uh, they're getting overly scared. Again, maybe putting on some hedges. But beyond that, uh, there's still a large population out there that is thinking these markets are going to push to new all-time highs here sooner rather than later. So as you're, as you're talking about the, this, this bull market, Corey, are you, are you kind of talking about the last year since, since the start of the pandemic or, or further back than that? Both, to be honest with you. After that crash in March, the market has, for the most part, just gone straight up. It's been an impressive move. But even before that, right, We the markets were so strong. And I, I keep on thinking back to, I think it was 2017, when the markets just went up about half a percent or a quarter percent every day. And it was so boring. We saw the VIX down in single digits. We're not there right now. The VIX is still right around 20, right? So we don't have that much complacency in these markets but overall, this is an undeniable bull market that these markets are still in. They keep on hitting all time highs. What's been interesting is back to that rotation comment of mine. It has been a bit more selective. So we're seeing more active management of money here, picking and scalping some of the unloved sectors, whether right or wrong. Like we were talking about airlines going up, having massive pops a few months ago or at the tail end of last year before anything was really open. That was just showing how willing investors still are to get into somewhat risky sectors, especially when the economy was for the most part shut down. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the most significant macro factors that you're paying attention to right now? Uh, it always goes back to central banks. So central banks and the Fed, especially just continuing to put money into the system. That's a major macro factor that always or always has at least supported these markets broadly. But we have started to see some other central banks outside of the US at least start to talk about tightening their monetary policy. I think that's just a massive driver when it comes to markets and their overall stability, because we're in this weird time right now where negative news and negative data is actually good for markets because expectations are that central banks are going to remain easy rather than good data being actually good for markets. Good data is actually selling markets off in the short term because people are starting to get worried that central banks are going to start tapering. So central banks, always a key consideration. Uh, also, the pandemic, uh, any sort of more lockdowns would obviously be negative, but those are also virtually impossible to predict, I think. And then outside of that, I'm very interested in the bond market because that is a massive market and interest rates, they just kept on declining. I don't think anybody thought that we'd see the 10-year well under 1%. And then talking that the 10 years at 1.6% and people say, that's not sustainable. Look at how much it's moved since March. 
but yet it's still historically at a very low level. So all of this plays into the psyche of investors because A, you have that concept of the Fed has your back. So anything negative in the markets, the Fed's going to come in and save you. And B, low interest rates, people have to put their money in the market. And quite frankly, that's been a major driver in this last year is how many new investors have come into the markets because they've been forced to either A, staying at home and having nothing else to do. So they might as well try to make some money that way. And also B, the younger generation, they can't put their money in savings account. And quite frankly, the way that home prices are going and really inflation is going, they need to put their money to work and they're left with the markets. So that's been a major driver too, in terms of where money has flowed and the new investors in the sector. I think those are the key considerations that we need to understand for the near and long term. So, Corey, you were mentioning volatility there, and we the the price action in the cryptos last week was extremely volatile. So, can you point to anything in particular that might have caused that? Uh, well, last week there was news out of China that they were cutting down uh, or restricting transactions in Bitcoin. Then they also went after the Bitcoin miners, and those are a key. A portion of what's going on in China for Bitcoin. It's a lot of the miners are based out of China. Those are some key considerations. Elon Musk, he is becoming a key consideration or player when it comes to cryptocurrencies. But also remember that it's not just last week that cryptocurrencies have been volatile. They, mm-hmm. they typically are volatile. And that's one thing that draws some of these traders to the cryptocurrencies. They understand that they can lose 30, 40, 50%, like we just saw in the last month, but they don't seem to care. They, they, they're they happy with this volatility because they can make 20, 30, 40% in a matter of a couple of days, sometimes when the conventional markets aren't even open. So this is just the story of cryptos in my eyes is that it's a volatile sector. And that's what the younger generation and quite frankly, retail audience likes is volatility because you can see some quick, fast gains and losses. So does that price action action suggest that cryptos are really more of a speculation at this point rather than an investment? Oh, absolutely. I I think that they have been for forever, to be quite honest with you, is that they are a speculation. And what we're seeing in the price action and the volatility is you have to treat it like a speculation unless you want to just put some money into it and ignore it. But well, you could check three days later and you could lose a lot of your money or three days earlier and you could be up a lot. And that's a speculative market because, well, it's also hard to value, right? How do you value a cryptocurrency? It's virtually impossible, except for the fact of understanding just the sentiment towards cryptos. And I haven't seen a whole lot of people fully bail out of cryptos. I talk a lot about cryptos to guests and there are some guests that say, oh, look, cryptos are going to, they're going to crash and that's going to wake people up. We just went through a crash of 50% and we're not seeing everybody continue to flood out of cryptos. Cryptos have actually bounced back pretty strong in the last couple of days. So to me, it's a speculative market. And I think there's a lot of investors that understand that and they're playing it for what it is. And that's quick price action, whether up or down. So we're we're speaking on the morning of May 25th, and kind of by coincidence, you're actually co-hosting a silver Q&A today with Jeff Christian and the Happy Hawaiian. So do you have a sense of the types of questions that silver investors have about the market? Oh, yes, I do. Um, there's been a number of questions that have come in, and it depends what kind of silver investor you're talking about, right? Uh, there's a lot of questions on manipulation, and uh, those questions have been around for a long time, right? And how the options and future exchanges work. But some of the newer questions that we're seeing, and this is coming from the Wall Street Silver Reddit forum there, is, is a short squeeze possible? Is it actually going to work if enough people get into this trade? And that's the one thing that I find very interesting because we can talk all we want about debt or other aspects that should drive metals higher, but can the smaller retail and trader actually make some money here by forcing the bigger players' hands? It's an interesting question, and that's really what we're going to focus a lot on. Because, look, I've been in the precious metals sector for over a decade now, and I've heard a lot of these same arguments that are made by 
uh, the tired and true gold bugs, let's call them, where it's going to be debt. We're going to see a currency collapse. Look, on a long enough time frame, they're probably right in some sense, but that's hard to invest around. And again, touching back on what type of investors are in the sector right now, they're looking for price moves now. And the whole question of can a short squeeze work for silver rather than just putting in a top like we saw back in the early part of this year, that's a key question that people are wondering and how it would all work within the options and within the futures market. Because there is an interesting dynamic there of just how much uh, the ETF value is compared to what's going on in the futures exchanges. So that's a key consideration. Also, this Basel III, uh, what might come out of that? That's tough to say. And that also reminds me of when the IMF was altering the SDR, right? And everyone was saying, oh, look at the inclusion of China's currency and what that could do for the sector. These are short-term events that sometimes can cause some price volatility. But overall, I think that uh, investors need to be focused on what is going to drive price here in the short term, because that's what investors are worried about right now. And uh, touching back on the manipulation, manipulation, that, that's what the short term aspect is, right? So can it get pushed above, let's say for silver, that $30 level? We'll be focusing a lot on that. Mm -hmm. So as, as we're talking about silver here, Corey, has there been anything that has really surprised you about silver um, since, let's say, the, the beginning of this year of 2021? Not so much surprised, but I find curious in terms of what's driving silver, right? Because silver was holding up at the tail end of last year, 2020, much better than gold. And that was because of its industrial uses. We saw the run that the base metals went on, and it was pretty easy to point to the base metals and say, okay, look, the industrial use of silver here, that's holding it up better than gold. But now that we've started to see gold run, then the question is, well, is it now a precious metal, right? And that's one of the benefits silver has is that it can play off these two narratives. And right now, silver's just been trading in a range rather than what gold went through an eight month decline and correction. Silver simply traded within this range for the most part in the low 20s to $30 level. And now we're closing in on that $30 level. Are we going to get a breakout? The other thing that I'm really looking at is the disconnect between where gold is compared to historic all-time highs and where silver is compared to historic all-time highs, because silver hasn't even come close to that $50 level, and gold was at an all-time high, depending on where you view it, on the futures or on the spot market, just about nine months ago. So there is that big disconnect. I like silver, and I like some silver stocks, but... The silver stock sector, it's a lot more selective and you need to do a lot more research into the silver companies because, quite frankly, good silver companies usually turn into good precious metals companies, which is silver and gold. Absolutely. So what is your outlook for the metals for this year, Corey? This year in the short term, especially precious metals, we'll start there. They're looking good. Gold went through a correction. It needed a correction. It went through an eight-month correction. Everyone said, oh, this is a long correction. But you look, gold was running for two years, and it was running aggressively higher. So it needed a bit of a cool-off stage. And bottoming in the high 1600s, that's really good. Let's, let's not forget that 1600 to 1700 that's a good gold price compared to where we were for the last decade. So... I think, and I like the rebound that we're seeing in gold here. I don't know how far it can go. I'm not going to come on and say it's going to get to all-time highs by the end of this year, but it's a process. And quite frankly, gold has put in a very nice stair-stepping pattern higher where uh, it, it is looking very strong right now. And silver can get pulled up by gold and silver can also work on its own. So with newer investors that come into the sector, I do think that they're going to like silver as well as gold. The biggest driving factor for precious metals, though, is getting more interest in the sector. And that happens two ways, one of which being in an uptrend. That brings in generalists. So we're just starting a new uptrend here. And uh, when it comes to what will actually be driving in terms of data, what's inflation going to do? Is it transitory? Is it not transitory? We don't know yet. Only time will tell. But the recent data from just two weeks ago, very encouraging for Finally, precious metals fundamentalists to say, here we go. We're starting to get the data. It's starting to become a better picture for us all. 
So, Corey, as you mentioned, the the inflation aspect uh, when it comes to precious metals, does it is that simply kind of uh, a, a a tide that lifts all boats when it comes to pushing the metals higher? I think it can be, and it also plays into sentiment too, right? Where if people really do get worried about inflation, then naturally they invest or uh, balance their portfolio by moving into precious metals. That's at least what's happened in history. And I think that can continue to happen. It, it's it's another chip in the bullish camp, right? Mm-hmm. And that's all you need. You need some momentum. It's not going to be just one aspect of, say, inflation. It, it, it needs to tie into interest rates. And interest rates need to maybe slow some of that momentum to the upside. It's not a bad environment if inflation's moving higher and rates are moving higher as long as inflation is outpacing rates gradually. And the one thing that I really think we need to hope for as precious metals investors is a slow and gradual rise because that last bull market back at the end of last decade, let's call it, it was very short-lived because of how fast everything went. This bull market, if we want to call it it for precious metals, and I think it is, it's already lasting arguably longer than that last bull market. So that's more encouraging. Everyone talks about these commodity super cycle. Hopefully, who knows if we're in a commodity super cycle. Again, only time will tell. But right now, look, inflation's going in the right direction. Interest rates have slowed down. Investors are looking outside of the growth sector because growth has been slow. That lends a little bit more credence into the precious metals. So as you're talking about this commodity super cycle, Corey, are there any other metals that you're looking at in this environment? I'm very interested in copper because copper rarely goes on these sort of euphoric runs and it just blew through some of the past historic uh, resistance levels that everyone was looking for. And the world does need copper. I agree with that, but I find the copper stocks very interesting because a lot of people talk about, oh, look at the supply deficit the copper is going to be into. But I look at a lot of copper stocks, especially ones that have been a while, around for a while. We have a lot of de-risk assets out there that could come online if enough funding was put into them. And I realize it takes a while to bring these 20, 30-year mine life assets online, but I can think of six at least assets spread around the world that need about two, $3 billion to build. They generate an IRR of at lower prices, 20, 25%, which is a good profitable business. They just haven't gotten the funding to build these assets. So that's what I find so interesting about the copper market is, is the funding going to free up for these major projects? Because we have seen a lot more money come into the companies when it comes to resource stocks, we just haven't seen these big mega deals yet. And that can, I think, really drive copper and drive the rest of the commodity sector. Those are my focus right now. Um, I also talk a lot about uranium because there seems to be these uranium bulls out there, right? And even with the uranium spot price not moving, look at what the uranium stocks have done. It has just screamed higher. They have screamed higher. So, What's the disconnect? Is it the uranium price or is it the stocks? I'm very curious to see how that plays out. So you, you cover a lot of miners on your website, Corey. So how do you think about structuring your portfolio? Do you make an effort to have some larger producers as a safer bet and offset some of the risk of the more exp- exploratory plays? Uh, I, I do, but maybe not intentionally, to be honest with you. I like the riskier exploration plays and even the mid-tiers. I find that a lot of the majors I hold are because one of my smaller stocks got bought out by them. And then I'm naturally kind of rotating that money into some of the majors. I usually pull back some of my positioning because I I talk to and I follow the junior space a lot more. So for me, I like investing in the riskier uh, exploration plays, but that's also just my risk profile. And when I look at these uh, smaller companies, the exploration plays, I really am looking for some sort of a takeout here, right? I want money going into the ground. I want them building some sort of asset and I want them to have a blue sky component to it because that's when the M&A action happens, even though unfortunately m a has been pretty slow recently. So what boxes do you want to be checking off when it comes to these riskier explorers or developers, Corey? 
team. Everyone says management. For me, the most important part of management is past success. I always go to the company's website. I go into the management tab and I dive into what other companies they work for. And I don't want to hear that they've been able to raise X hundred million dollars of capital. Because to me, what happened to that capital? Where was the value on the back end of that? I know a lot of groups that can raise money, but they don't end up making money for shareholders, especially in the long-term sense. I want to see companies that have been sold, past successes, because when you have these past successes, not only does it make your current shareholders money, it builds loyalty with those shareholders. They're more likely to put more money into your next company. And you then have those relationships with the major miners, ones that could take you over. So it just shows that these companies, these management teams know what these bigger companies are looking for. And that's critical. They need to know how to get a deal done. Because if you don't get a deal done, you're going to find yourself stuck in a bear market holding these shares that honestly should have been something else. So once you've identified a project or company that you like, what are what is some of the advice that you think is important for investors in the space to remember for when they want to be buying a stock? Couple different factors. One thing that I don't think investors do enough of is simply reach out to the management teams, get a feeling for management, talk to them directly. These are small companies. They should want to talk to investors. Sometimes it'll be the IR person. That's perfectly fine. Build up a relationship with the company so that you understand what their goals are. Because quite frankly, reading through presentations online, it's hard to do. You're reading a text document or you're listening to one of these recorded presentations at one of these conferences. You don't have a chance to truly ask questions or truly understand what the company is doing. So I think that is critical to talk to management and then also look at what the company is planning on doing. What's the news flow going to be? Because as much as some companies can go out there and market and drive the share price that way, if you're a true investor, you want the asset to be developing. So you want to know what they're going to do to keep on de-risking the project and building value for the company. It, it comes down to team and project. Those are the two key components. You, th th that's really all it comes down to for these companies. So you need to have a pretty good understanding of both. And then you can kind of look at the chart. There's some other aspects that I really think you should look at in terms of when the company last financed, when that's coming free trading, uh, if they have a limited field season, when they can get on the ground, what their news flow is going to be. Those are key considerations. But again, you can get all this information from talking to companies or trying to talk to other people like you and I that talk to companies and say, hey, can you ask this question for me? Because that's how I get a lot of my questions for companies too, is what are all of you, the investors looking at? What are you concerned at with this company? Because if it's one or two people asking that question, I think there's a lot of people wondering it. So just clearing up that information on a personal level, I think is very important for investors. So is there anyone in the space that you've learned a lot from that you find an invaluable resource for knowledge in this space, Corey? Yes, I'm always learning, though. And one thing I've been very impressed with is the newer newsletter writers that have come into this space, a lot more balanced in fundamentals and technicals. They're doing a lot of good work out there. And I think they have helped to bring in some newer investors into the sector because they're not just touting kind of the old school narrative, right, of why you should be investing in these companies. They're asking the tougher questions and they're investing their own money. That's one thing I really like that I've seen with some of these new newsletter writers is that you can follow along with their portfolios. Like Dave Erfley at the Junior Miner Junkie, he just shares, he flat out just gives you a screen cap of his investments. And I think that's very valuable. I like some of the newer, again, newsletter writers. Silver Chartist is a good guy. There's a lot of new guys out there that are very good. And quite frankly, where I learn a lot from is talking to these companies. Talk to these companies and talk to these groups of companies that have done it before and try to understand what their secret is. Because everyone has a little bit of a different secret, but it's the groups that I think you really need to be talking to as well in terms of understanding, you know, why? Why is this working? You can look at the Oxygen Capital Group. You can look at the Osisco Group of companies, just to name a few. There's a lot of other groups out there 
that have done some very good work. So understand where or how their sweet spot is and how they're driving value. So over this past year, we've have you seen money come into the space for more junior companies? And is this a positive indication for the space, Corey? Oh, absolutely. This last year, I think, has been one of the best financing windows for companies in at least the last decade because of how long it is. Even as gold was going through that eight-month correction, companies were still raising money. There's a lot of cash in companies' bank accounts right now. And that's encouraging because they get to go do the work that can drive the stocks, right? And that's the most important thing. If companies don't have money, then they're not able to do the work that will drive stocks higher. But now they do have the money. So look, exploration's risky. Some of them, there's going to be a lot of misses out there, but at least there are going to be some successes. So I think this is a great environment that these companies actually have cash in the bank and they're spending it in the ground. So to me, this is one of the best and most encouraging signs for the precious metal sector, especially when it comes to the stocks, because there is money available and there's money coming into the actual companies, not just landing in the ETFs. That's what's so critical too, is that it's not just inflows into the ETFs, it's inflows into the companies. And if a company right now doesn't have money, there's an issue there. You should be asking a question, why don't they have money? Because there's this massive window here and they need to be taking advantage of it because you never know when these financing windows close. And this one is already quite long. So where do the mid-tiers fit, uh, the mid-tier producers fit into your investing framework, Corey? Personally, I, I like what a lot of these mid-tiers are doing in terms of cash flow. So I actually prefer some of the mid-tiers over the majors because they are generating some nice cash flow. And I think they're going to be the quicker ones to make some acquisitions. That's more just hopeful on my part, but the mid-tiers, they're quicker to pivot. And we're still seeing some of these majors try to offload some of their non-core assets, the mid-tiers aren't bogged down by these non-core assets. They're focused on production. They're focused on making money. And from there, they have been making money. So I find them to be in a great sweet spot where we're seeing better margins, increased production that moves the needle a lot more than a major. So for me, looking at producing companies, I prefer the mid-tiers over the majors right now because I do think they give you that potential added torque to the upside because they're smaller. Increases in production do better. They move the bottom line much more for these companies. And these guys, they're good teams that are producing. I think that's a real sweet spot right now is to play these mid-tiers because I'm hoping they're going to be fairly aggressive coming up and start to acquire some other good, interesting projects. I've heard you say before, Corey, that that you want to see a willingness from management to exit a position. So what does this mean and why is it so important to shareholders? It creates that liquidity event for shareholders. It puts money or at least uh, a, a premium on the shares that they're currently holding. I know that management teams can sometimes get ripped on because they have the change of control terms in their uh, employment contracts. So they get paid a lot on the back end. But seeing a company get a deal done, it just frees up capital. So it's good for the sector because now it frees up this capital that isn't stuck in this company. And the biggest risk, I think, to investors when investing in exploration companies is that you're investing in a lifestyle company because that money can slowly get drained from the company's coffers. And all of a sudden, you're in a bear market the company is bleeding money because management just keeps on taking salaries. They don't have enough money to do work. You're going to get stuck in that position. And unless you're a good trader, which I hope there are more good traders in this sector, the fact of the matter is, and it happens to me, we get married to our positions uh, and we just, we, we hold them for too long. So a liquidity event, an m and a transaction, that forces investors' hands to move that money around. And that's constantly what we need is money moving from one stock to another so that the good stocks do continue to rise. People can make money. And when they get sold, huge money is available to move into other companies. And then it forces these management teams to go out there and find other projects. So that actually can spur some more M&A or ground staking 
but it usually is smaller M&A to bring other projects into their new ventures. That's all good for the sector. More M&A, always good for the sector, even though I'll preface this by saying recent M&A, obviously been taken uh, somewhat negative sometimes, but that's simply because we have these major assets that are sitting out there that I think everyone's just waiting to get taken out. Like just wait for, hopefully, if Great Bear gets taken out, think of that liquidity event. Think of the money that's going to be freed up to flow into other stocks. Yeah, that's a great point, Corey. So as when we think about um, analyzing these companies, how do you think about share structure and what are some pointers that you think are pertinent to, to remind our listeners of? So I like a tighter share structure, but that it's not necessarily a turnoff if a company does have a few hundred thousand or a few, uh, a few hundred million shares out there. We have seen successes on the back end of that. I think what's important is going back to the news flow, understand when they last raised money, what price they raised money at, because that four month hold, when it comes up, you always do see some more liquidity in the stock. Also look at where the warrants, where the options are priced, make sure there aren't too many of them, because while options and warrants can be good for financing purposes, it can bring more money into the company. It can put a natural ceiling on share prices if there are too many out there. And also look where those shares are held. I like to see about 50% of those shares in the retail float. Let's say 40 to 60%, I think, is the sweet spot there. And then you want management to hold shares. One other perk of talking to management is ask them when they were buying their shares and make sure that math makes sense. Because sometimes these guys hold a large position because they bought half a penny stock really early on that's not the same as them taking part in financings as the company is progressing. And also be aware that sometimes these management teams get paid in shares. One comment that I just, it it really got me over the bear market was all these management teams saying, we're not taking salaries. When in fact, they were accruing their fees on the company's books and then just taking shares at these really depressed levels. That doesn't help anybody in that sense. And then sometimes they can have big share positions. Not the same as when management is buying on the uptrend at any time, quite frankly. And then when you look to institutional holders, they're good to have. You obviously want institutional holders, but they're not, let's say, the most important out there. Because quite frankly, if the market turns, institutions can be out and that can be very tough on these companies. So that's why I don't like seeing, say, institutions holding 60 or 70 percent of a company, because if something turns then they'll turn and they can be very quick to hit the sell button and really beat up a stock. So it's a balance, right? And it's always a moving target. But again, 40 to 60% in retail management, hopefully holding 10, 15% and bought at reasonable times. And then institutions making up the rest of it. That to me is a perfect share structure. Excellent, Corey. Those are some some great pointers there. Um, Do you have anything else that you have on your mind that you'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, for all the precious metals investors out there, again, don't get married to any positions and also understand the work that's going on. We are coming into a very hot time right now where the Northern Hemisphere, especially Northern Canada, is going to open up for drilling. There are a lot of drill programs that are about to kick off, if not already kicked off. And understand, again, news flow. The most important thing is here, news flow. We have been seeing stocks run higher once drilling starts, and sometimes they can get overvalued into drill results. Be an active trader. Understand that a position has gone up a lot without any real catalyst in terms of significant news. Maybe trim some of your position. It's not the worst thing to sell at a gain, even if those stocks keep on moving higher because you're freeing yourself up to invest in other companies. So that to me is the most important thing. Don't get married to a stock. And when you're seeing gains without any supporting news flow, understand that it might be a good idea to take a little bit off the table. You don't need to exit your position, but lock in a little bit of gains because we've all been there. We've all been up 300% and then right back to neutral, right? And that's a pretty discouraging feeling when you leave that much money on the table. Absolutely, Corey. Um, Tell our listeners where we can find more about you. Uh, Anywhere other than kereport.com? 
we do have a podcast, so Corlin Economics Report. You can find all of our content there. If you live down in the U.S., our weekend show, two-hour weekend show, is broadcast on old school radio. So that's available to everybody, but really the best way to find our stuff is come to the website, kereport.com. Every day I'm posting content anywhere from three, six plus interviews, market focused and a lot on companies. And I love when people get in touch with me, my email address, fleck at kereport.com. If you want me to chat with any companies, if you have any specific questions for companies, Email those to me and I'll get those answered for you. I can be your go-between for these companies because I understand some people are a bit shy to reach out to these management teams. I have no problem doing it and I'm happy to answer those questions. Excellent, Corey. I really appreciate your time today. Hey, thank you, Tom. Thanks for the invite. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. Nothing on this podcast should be taken as investment advice. Guests on this show are not compensated for their appearance. Listeners are urged to educate themselves and make their own decisions. Do not base any investment decisions on the information contained. To view our full disclaimer, please visit our website.